Well, hello everyone. Uh, well, thanks uh, for the introduction. So I, I hope I will be up to the expectations now after such an introduction. So, um, transport of materials, energy, information is crucial for the world we are living in. And transporting systems are present at every possible scale, from a large transporting, from a large container ships to the very small living cells. Now, regardless of the scale or the application of all the transporting systems, they all have one thing in common. They all involve directed and controlled motion. And in a macroscopic world, in principle, we know how to do this, how to achieve controlled and directed motion. But when we try to downscale, to go to much small scales, then we don't know anymore how to do this efficiently. But if you look at the living cells, which are much smaller, then they know how to do this in a perfection. Here is an example of biological nanomachine. It's a, of very small size, a few nanometers, and it can move on a straight line in a controlled manner, and it can carry a big cargo. So on this biological machine is inside of all living cells, in your living cells, and there are many different types of this kind of machines present in the cells. That's why often living cells are considered as a small factory of tiny machines which can operate on nanoscale. Now, you have heard all about perhaps nanotechnology. Nanotechnology is a field of research and technology which involves manipulating a matter on a nanometer size, basically on the level of individual molecules or even atoms. To give you an idea of which scale I'm talking about, imagine a grain of a sand. You can all see that, right, with your naked eye. And then it's about the size of 10 to 6 nanometers. Now, the scale in which nanomachine operates is about a million times smaller. So it's typically a size of a DNA or protein. And now what we want to do is to be able to achieve the same kind of motion as living cell can do. But it is not that easy, because in a macroscopic world, when we try to achieve motion and control it, we use the rules of a gravity. But when you go to nanoscale, the gravity is not there anymore. What becomes now dominant is the Brownian motion and viscosity forces. Now, it has been a formidable challenge for a scientist to be able to design, to build an artificial, fully artificial nanomachines, which can be of comparable size and comparable function as biological machines are. Here is an example of a nanomachine. This is truly artificial nanomachine built up by a tour from Rice University. And this machine, you can see it has wheels. It's a few nanometer and it can move along the surface. However, this machine is not autonomous. So it, it moves because it's being dragged by something else or pushed or simply by Brownian motion. Now, what we want to actually achieve is to get really truly nanomotoring machine is to put a motor inside, because this one cannot propel itself, but if we put a motor inside, maybe it will be able to do that. And that was the idea we had. Now, in order to do that, we should be able to also create a nanomotor. Now, of course, nanomotors exist in living cells, and I already told you that before. But fortunately, we can also make nanomotors in a lab. And in 1999, Ben Feringa, it's a professor exactly from Groningen University. He developed a molecular motor. So this is, this is a very small molecule. It has to rotate, and I don't know why it's not rotating now anymore. But the, normally, the upper part of this molecule rotates relative to the lower part, about 360 degrees, and this rotation is continuous. And the most important thing is that it's unidirectional, so it always rotates in the same direction. Now, the idea we had, why don't we use these molecular motors in order to build a nano-vehicle? So here is our design. So we decided to build a small molecule of few nanometer, which will have a rigid part, which will serve as the chassis of our nano-vehicle. This is presented in red. So we will attach to it four motors, which can also serve as the wheels of this nano-vehicle. Therefore, we can refer to it, to it as a nano four-wheel drive. So what we expect is when we get put an energy source there, for instance, electricity or a light, these motors will be activated, they can rotate in one direction, and therefore they can push them, this nano vehicle to go along the surface. Now, the chemical structure of this molecule looks the following. In red, you see the chassis. In blue, you see the motor part which will rotate. And this is the animation, which has disappeared again. But 
it moves in a pedal wheel motion, so it's not exactly the way how the car will move. So if you will be the one who is riding this car, you will have a quite a bumpy road. But we don't expect really to have passengers in this car, right? So I don't think we will hear any complaints. All right, so I will not bore you with all the details how we made this molecule. It took a lot of time, a lot of efforts, a lot of chemical reactions, but we actually managed to do it. And we got our molecule, and we managed to do it different types. So the first one we did is the one which has all the wheels rotating in one direction. Therefore, you would expect for this molecule to move in a straight line. The other one we did is, which, uh, is a molecule which has all the wheels uh, rotating in a different direction. So what you then expect is a random movement on the surface. Now, if you look at this red part, which is the chassis of this car, you see here a small arrow. It means that when we try to put this machine on the surface, it can flip. So it's not completely rigid in that part. And what happens then, that the wheel change their orientation. So if that will happen with this molecule during the landing, then the wheels are changing the orientation, and now they are either directed towards each other or away from each other, which means for this molecule, which landed in the wrong way, there will be no movement. And if that will happen with a molecule which has a random orientation of the wheels, it will still be random, so you will still expect the random movement. Okay, now to, in principle, see whether we manage to synthesize this molecule, and actually if they are working so we can drive them, is to do a test drive. And here is our experimental setup. So what we did, we took the molecule, we put it on a copper surface in vacuum. But now this molecule is really small, it's about only four nanometers, and we have to somehow see it. In order to see it, we use scanning tunneling microscope. So it's a special technique, STM, which uses the, the difference of voltage between the microscope tip and the copper surface. So the electrons flows from the tip to the copper surface, and very conveniently, these electrons also activate our motors. So they cause our motors to rotate. So the wheels are rotating. So what actually is happening, that we use STM as a microscope and as a full tank at the same time. And that's how our molecule looks like, one of it, on the copper surface under the microscope. You see bright lobes, four of them. They each lobe correspond to each motor, to each wheel of our nano vehicle. Okay, so first we did our test drive. And we took the molecule, which has a random orientation of the wheels, right? So we expect a random movement. And indeed, what we saw for the first time, that the molecule moves on the surface of such a small size, and it can propel itself. And of course, it's random because it has a random orientation of wheels. Then when we look at the surface, what we saw is a molecule which is not moving at all. And what we believe is this, the, this is the one which flipped during the landing on the surface, so the orientation has changed, so now it's static. And finally, the main goal of our project, because we wanted to build a car, a nano car, which can move in a straight line. And here is the molecule, we put it on the surface, you see it now, it's moving from this corner, and it continues in a straight line. So here is the trajectory, so you can see that we did 10 folding steps, so we folded it 10 times, and overall, it moved almost in a straight line, about six nanometers. So now it's not perfectly straight, because what we believe that we cannot activate all the wheels at the same time. So maybe it, one up get activated, and then the second one, therefore, it's not perfectly in a straight line. So now, of course, you can ask me, that's fine, so we did it the first time, you can now make an, the smallest car in the world, but what are the applications, right? Well, to be honest with you, I don't really know. <laughs> but what I expect is that it can serve in all the cases when we need to provide a transport in the smallest case. Like, imagine in medicine when you want to do a targeted drug delivery or in technology. Now, the nanotechnology revolution suggests that one day we will be able to put a tiny machines inside of our body to do the routine screening or maintenance. Of course, we are really far from that future. But what I showed you, what we have now, is a prototype, a proof of a concept that we are actually capable of building a small devices and controlling their motion on that scale. Maybe one day we will look back at this prototype as we look back at early meter scale automobiles, because we might be on the brink of a new era of motoring, 
but now on a molecular level. Oh, thank you very much.